Hi, I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley, and welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. If you've been listening for a while, you know that we've been doing an ongoing series about the history of beer as the history of mankind and the history of all business. So much of civilization sprang out of beer from Mesopotamia and ancient societies all the way up to the modern age and industrialization. And today we want to tie all that together by talking about the modern beer industry, specifically craft brewing and home brewing and how those fit into this larger commercial beer world. To do that today, we're going to be interviewing Marcus Gall. Marcus lives in the Seattle area. He is a former beer distributor and a avid home brewer. Uh, he's also one of my very dear old friends. He and my husband were army buddies. We first met back in 2003, 2004, I think, when all three of us were attending the Defense Language Institute. Mark was studying Korean, and my husband and I were studying Thai. And we've both bounced around, but now we all live in the same state. We live in Spokane, and he and his wife Emily live in the Seattle area. So today we're going to be covering everything from the origins of beer styles in Europe to the effects of prohibition in the United States on the beer industry, including microbreweries and home brewing, all the way up to the modern day effects of large corporate breweries merging with smaller breweries and the effects of that on the average beer consumer. There's also going to be a lot of pretty geeky science coming out, so if that's not your thing, feel free to skip on over to the next episode. But if it is, welcome! You belong here. I also want to remind everyone that since this is our first interview, the opinions expressed by the interviewees and the interviewers are solely their own opinions. They do not represent their employers or any associates. Also, neither of us have received any compensation in any form from any of the companies that we discuss during this show. I promise that we will always, always, always clearly disclose if we have a financial relationship with one of the companies we discussed during the podcast. And with that, hi, Mark. Welcome to the show. Hello. So let's just jump in. Mark, why don't you tell us a little more about your first experiences with beer? I turned 21. I decided that if beer was going to be an acquired taste, I was going to acquire it. Um, So I turned 21 and... I went and uh, bought myself a six-pack of Pyramid Apricot Hefeweizen. Ew! I'm judging your beer choices, young gall. Not not a great idea. It was beer, at least in theory. And then the next six-pack of beer I bought was Longhammer IPA from Red Hook. And it was the most bitter beer I've ever, I'd ever had in my entire life. I swore off IPAs forever. Well, that certainly didn't last. You're kind of the IPA king now. When did that change? Right before my second deployment, my wife's aunt bought me a book called The Complete Joy of Homebrewing. I started reading about homebrewing. I bought another like five or six books because I was deployed and couldn't actually make my own beer at home. Yeah, contrary to what MASH taught us, the Army really does frown on brewing and stills in combat zones. Oh, yes. And then I got home. Before we even made it back to our house, I'd already bought my homebrewing kit. And within 24 hours of being back home, I had made my first batch of beer. Whoa, little eager, were you? Okay, so what kind of beer does a soldier make within 24 hours of getting home from a 13-month deployment? I was going for an American Pale Ale, but it ended up being something more like an American ESB. So what did you do next? I pretty much kept expanding my uh, my little homebrewing empire. I've brewed probably 30 or 40 batches of beer in the last few years. Um, I brew an average of 10 to 15 batches of beer a year. I have 10 five-gallon Cornelius kegs. I brew all grain now instead of with extract, and uh, and I've also started brewing my own sour beers. And Howard Cider, and I'm hoping to do a mead next year. I've even done a wine. My wife and I did a wine, a raspberry Riesling. Pretty tasty. Okay, so I've got to interject here with the story of my husband's first beer, which he had with you. My husband didn't even try beer until he was in his 30s, and Mark drove all the way across the state of Washington one weekend just so he could share that first beer with my husband Cameron. And it was nice beer. Mark, you brought, like, these six absolutely brilliant beers for us to try, 
And we all sat on our back porch after this really long day of working in the backyard and getting our new house ready. And you pulled out this delicious beer. You poured it into three glasses. We all took a, a deep whiff of it. It smelled toasty and delicious and said, cheers. And then we all took a drink of it. And the look on Cameron's face, I'd, I've never seen anything like it before. He was like trying to wipe something disgusting off his tongue. He was going, eh, eh, the got thing, yeah, that, that. And he just, he, he said it tasted horrible. It was like he was drinking battery acid, which is what he referred to it as. And I mean, at first we thought he was screwing with us and we, then we realized he was serious. And there was this moment where, Mark, I saw like the wheels start turning in your head immediately and you started rattling off chemical compounds trying to figure out exactly what it was that he was tasting differently. And within about two minutes, you'd figure out, you said it was the iso-alpha acids. Yep. And for those of you who don't know, which I didn't, iso-alpha acids are a bitter compound that come from hops. And I mean, there are hops in all beer. And it, we were able to figure out that my husband is actually allergic to hops, of all things. So no beer for him. Part of what I love about the story is that the science was just there. You automatically were able to dissect beer into all of its different chemical compounds. And that's not common. I mean, how many people in this world like to bake but couldn't actually tell you the exact chemical reaction that occurs when you add baking soda or baking powder to a cake? So tell us some more about why it was that you decided to learn so much about the actual chemistry of beer making. Well, so, I mean, as a home brewer, you're kind of always in a search for making better beer. Otherwise, you just buy beer at the grocery store. It's a lot easier that way. And even though anybody who homebrews will tell you it's cheaper to brew your own beer, it's not cheaper to brew your own beer. It is if you only count ingredients. The ingredients are cheaper. But you never start homebrewing without expanding your operation and spending more money. And it's, you're always chasing that ever-elusive savings. So you're looking for beer that you like better than anything you can get commercially. So learning the science actually speeds up the process of trial and error. So instead of, I mean, shooting in the dark, you can actually make informed decisions about it. That makes sense. So was it hard learning the chemistry behind the beer? I like science. Delicious, delicious science. I enjoyed the fact that everything I was learning about science wasn't going to be learned for a test. Instead, it was being learned for making better beer. So there's learning the chemistry behind beer, but what else have you studied that's helped you become a better brewer? Part of what I'm working on is getting my certification in the Beer Judge Certification Program. Learn how to specifically taste beer. During Seattle Beer Week in 2013, I think, um, I attended a sensory analysis class where we sat there with uh, the head of sensory analysis for what's called the Craft Brewers Alliance, which is Red Hook, Windmere Brothers, and Kona Brewing. And he sat there and he took pictures of their longboard lager, which is their lightest beer that they have, and then he doctored them with various off flavors, good flavors, assorted specific hop compounds, um, some specific yeast compounds. And so we were able to discuss what the what the chemical name was for that compound and then where it came from. And then we could each figure out what it tasted like to us because the human yeah. palate is really complicated. And so being able to explain what a compound tastes like to you helps you get on the same page with other people who are drinking the same beer. Because there's a compound called acetaldehyde. It's a intermediate product in the production of alcohol by yeast. If you read most brewing books, they will tell you that acetaldehyde tastes like green apples. I'd been looking for green apples in every beer I drank for years. The acetaldehyde doesn't taste like green apples to me. So what does it taste like? It's like apple skin. You know that slightly, it has kind of a bit of bitterness. Yeah, so like how... We all tasted the iso-alpha acids in the beer one way, but Cameron tasted them as this incredibly bitter taste. You're saying that you 
everyone tastes these compounds slightly differently. Exactly. You know, last month I bought this book called Wine Folly by uh, Madeline Puckett of the Wine Folly blog that's also in Seattle. And in it, there's this absolutely amazing list of flavors that are associated with wine. I was kind of blown away to see their infographic. I mean, thousands and thousands of very specific flavors that are associated with different wines. And I didn't realize till I read the book that each of those flavors is actually tied to a chemical. In fact, that's where most natural and artificial flavorings come from, is simply from reproducing a chemical that is known to be associated with that taste. And the more I've been studying wine for our upcoming podcasts on the history of wine, I was kind of blown away to realize that they can actually predict what flavors will be in each wine based off of what they know of the chemical compounds present in each variety of grape and how those different compounds are likely to react through the fermentation process. And I mean, there were literally thousands of different flavors ranging from cherry and blackberry to tobacco smoke and old leather and even cat piss. Cat piss! My favorite descriptor. Black. And honestly, I thought it was I thought it was kind of one of those silly, pretentious things someone would say until I actually had a wine that honest to goodness smelled like cat piss. Exactly. It's kind of mind blowing to me that one simple ingredient like a grape once it's fermented, can actually produce all of these different flavors. That's why they can say that uh, a Chardonnay tastes buttery or that a Shiraz tastes like jam and tobacco and leather and all of these other flavors simply because fermentation creates all of these different chemical compounds from the grape. And, And beer has more ingredients, so it has more possible combinations. So we've talked about how chemistry helps you both brew better beer and understand the taste of beer better. Let's talk about history. How does history help Mark Gall brew a better beer at home? The history of beer is pretty much the story of why we drink the beer we drink. Part of it went into science and we're doing it because of these scientific reasons. And part of it went into history and beers are made this way because, well, that's how they used to be made. A beer really, the story of beer is kind of driven by the story of taxation. Uh, tell me more. How so? Well, most of the current ways that, are, that beer is made were driven by different countries' ways of making money off of beer. You know, I think we've covered some of that in our previous episode on beer and industrialization when we talked about how, especially in Elizabethan England and throughout Northern Europe, they started really strongly regulating what you called beer and making sure that they knew what was beer that lasted longer because it had hops in it and what was ale, which wasn't as well preserved. Well, so that's the story of hops. Hops are most beer drinkers' favorite compound. They are a small flowering vine. It is a vine, not a vine, with a B, that were found somewhere in the French countryside around the early 1500s. Once they were found, they're actually a relative of uh, cannabis. And unlike other medieval beer preservatives, they could be cultivated. Yes, you can cultivate them, and they have, um, they're safe. Yeah, we talked about how there's actually uh, chemical compounds in the hops that don't just add a bitter flavor, but they also actually are an antibacterial agent and help preserve the beer and keep it from going bad. Not that anyone knew that was happening at the time they started using hops. Oh, yes. Well, they also didn't know what yeast was, so. I should say when we're talking about making the beer last longer, what we're talking about is bacterial spoilage. No known pathogens can survive beer. That's the reason beer was a replacement for drinking water for the entire Middle Ages. When we're talking about preserving it, we're more talking about preserving flavor than making it safe to drink. Actually, nowadays, we ferment everything in stainless steel, these giant cylindroconical fermenters in a completely closed system. Everything is perfectly cleaned and sanitized, so we don't really have issues with spoilage bacteria those organisms will make your beer taste weird. Um, some people like that. That's where sour beer came from. All beer was sour beer for a long, long time. Uh, but the big ones that they used when, before hops were found were bog, bog myrtle, uh, yarrow. So that's that was what, mostly what they used. And then it was found hops can be cultivated. You don't need as much of them to get the bitterness. And also, in the 13 or 1400s, the church owned 
what was called Gruet, which is what the mixture of herbs were. They owned the recipe for that. So if you made beer, you had to go to church and pay for your allotment of Gruet to make your beer. And hops got around that method of taxation. So if I'm getting this right, hops allowed the average Joe to make decent tasting beer without having to go to the church for it. It broke up the church's monopoly on it. Oh, yes. So that's kind of why hops became uh, more well understood. It sounds like there were some pretty major incentives for finding an alternative to the Gruet. What else had people tried before they discovered hops? In the UK, people were adding whatever they could find to make it bitter, including things that were not good. Uh Uh-oh, how bad are we talking here? I knew opium was added sometimes. Yikes. Uh, there was a couple, there was some really, really, really noxious stuff that was added and was actually responsible for killing people. That was what caused the UK to go to hops. I don't know specifically why the Kingdom of Bavaria went to hops, um, but when they went to hops, they went to hops with all of their might. They released what's called the Reinheitsgebot, um, which is the German beer purity law. That's how it's known now. It was originally the Bavarian beer pur- purity law. That was in the early 1500s, right? Like 1520? Yes. Now, we've talked before about how the oldest beer regulations in the world were in the Code of Hammurabi, but this Bavarian law is the oldest food regulation in the world that is still in use today. It was that important to Bavarian and German culture that has been preserved over centuries. Well, and it was so important to the Kingdom of Bavaria that when German reunification happened, the Kingdom of Bavaria insisted that it become the law of the land for Germany. Can you summarize it? What's the gist of the law? So the regulation is actually really complicated. The Reader's Digest version is that beer can only be made from four ingredients. It was originally three ingredients, water, malted barley, and hops. What's the fourth ingredient? Yeast. Oh, of course. Because they found out yeast exists. Because originally it was just called God is good. So before we knew what yeast was, was making beer just kind of a a hit or miss? It wasn't a random occurrence, but it was not a planned occurrence. So we've learned that brewers have been cultivating yeast for thousands of years, all the way back to the Vikings. The Vikings had a spoon. Each family had their wooden spoon that they would stir the wort after it was cooled and magically fermentation would start. What they didn't realize is that inside the wood was where all the yeast lived. And so as they stirred, the yeast would get into the wort and start fermenting. That explains so much. For the last few years, I've been seeing these giant wooden spoons that you're supposed to hang on your wall becoming really popular in home decor. In fact, even Pottery Barn was selling this giant wooden spoon. But that makes sense because that would have been a traditional Northern Europe thing to have hanging on your wall. Tell me some other ways that yeast has been cultivated accidentally over the years. So in Belgium, there's a group of breweries that do sour beers. They're located mostly outside of Brussels in an area called the Peyotenland, which is become world famous for its bacteria. Uh, They have these giant brew houses that up in the ceiling of the brew house is these huge vats that are about six six inches to 12 inches deep. As soon as they finish with the boil, they dump the beer into those, open up all the windows, and let the beer cool overnight, or let the work cool overnight in these, it's called a cool ship. It inoculates all the work with the bacteria and yeast that are in the night air. And then they dump that into wooden barrels and age it for anywhere from one to three or four years. If you go get a traditional lambic, then that's what you're getting. And it's probably the oldest type of beer that's still currently made in its true form. So is that unique to Belgium? Is it only made there? There are a few breweries in Um, the U.S. that are experimenting with that type of brewing system. Most notably is Allagash Brewery in Maine. They have set up their own cool ship um, in the roof of their brewery where they do cool ship fermented beers. Wait, so how long have they been doing this process in Belgium? Since the 11 or 1200s. So if it's so famous, why did it take so long for the style to cross the pond and start being made here in the United States? Well, 
most of the craft brewers in the U.S. learned beer from Belgium and Germany, a little bit from the U.K. too. That's kind of where we look to for inspiration. Every brewer that you know today that makes beer commercially wasn't alive during Prohibition. Prohibition killed our, our own natural beer history. So we had to look to other places that had more of a beer culture than we did. A lot of U.S. brewers originally looked there for inspiration and then are like, well, we, we're Americans. We can do it better. But for the longest time, there was in the, in the beer community worldwide – there was this idea that the only place you could do cool ship fermented beer and get beer that tasted good was in this little area of Belgium. So every other brewery was afraid to even try it until Allagash was like, well, we might as well try. Worst case scenario, we end up with bad beer. But really, microorganisms that are in the air are in the air pretty close to everywhere. If you do it right, you can uh, make good, spontaneously fermented sour beer anywhere. It just takes time, and it takes blending, and it takes uh, a lot of work. I want to go back to what you just said, that prohibition destroyed beer culture in the United States. Uh, talk to us some more about how prohibition destroyed, as you say, beer culture in the United States. Prior to prohibition, the, the U.S. had about somewhere between 400 and 1,800 breweries, and almost all of them went out of business when prohibition happened. After prohibition, there was about 60 and even that started to slowly dwindle until the craft brewing renaissance, and they were all making the same darn beer anyway. So now we again have what's been more traditional long term is there's some brewers that make beer for everybody, and then there's a lot of smaller ones who make it in their own home for just themselves and their guests. And that's kind of where home brewers kind of have fit in, and home brewers have really started the craft beer renaissance. Well, let's talk about that for a second. What part does hit knowing history of the beer industry play in being a part of that craft beer renaissance and being a home brewer? Well, it's kind of the way history is important in any anything. If you don't have an understanding of your own history, you can't really make steps forward. Beer has really basically gotten into, two, into the current present style because of two things, taxation or because it tastes good. So you got to figure out which one it is before you decide you're going to go breaking rules to try to make a new beer. Otherwise, you're going to end up with beer that's really bad. Okay, so speaking of bad beer, how do you as a home brewer and the brewing community in general really feel about these macro brewers, these large commercial brewers like, I mean, Budweiser? And I'm not just talking from a taste profile, because I know I've heard people say over and over again, oh, it tastes horrible, it tastes like swill. But I mean, overall, as part of the brewing community, how do you feel about them within that industry? So homebrewers and Budweiser have a very interesting dynamic. So most homebrewers, not all, but a large number of homebrewers started as beer drinkers and then crafty beer drinkers and then became homebrewers. And I've, this is something I've noticed with a lot of craft beer drinkers in general. When you first l learn about craft beer and you first kind of following the, the gospel of craft beer, so to speak, you go out with like a kind of an overreaction negatively towards the big beer makers, Bud, Miller, Coors, because they're, they're quote unquote watery. Uh, and they are, let's be honest. And then once you start learning more about brewing, you have kind of, you have to have kind of a grudging respect for those brewers. I would never drink it because I like to taste what I'm drinking, but I can appreciate how much work goes into making sure that those beers taste the way they do. It takes a lot more skill to make a light lager than it does to make a an IPA. Because anything that goes wrong with an IPA, other than some really, really, really out there things, can be covered up with more hops. So while I love my IPAs, I can appreciate the skill that it takes to make a really good light lager. Well, and it's not just about making a good light lager once. It's doing it consistently over and over again on a mammoth scale across dozens of locations. And it tastes exactly the same, and they make it in seven or eight different breweries, all located all in different places in the U.S. with different water profiles, and they make it all taste the same all the time. That's pretty impressive. I, I want to be really clear here that you're not actually talking about their ethics or marketing strategy or trying to exclude smaller breweries from the market or mergers. You're just talking about the actual process of how they make beer. 
Yeah. Yeah, I would obviously prefer if people started drinking more craft beer because I also have the certain kind of anti-corporate mindset. I have issues with their ethics aren't where I prefer my ethics to be, especially on the whole pay-to-play uh, frustration. Now, really quick, I want to go back to history for a second. Before we started recording, we were talking about one of our previous episodes where we discussed the history of IPAs, India Pale Ales, and the generally accepted story being that they're so hoppy and bitter because someone figured out that that was how they could ship beer to India during the imperial period. So... An IPA was the India Pale Ale that was designed to, to survive that long voyage from the UK to India. And you took exception to that story. So talk to me, what do IPAs actually have to do with India? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. All right, I'm going to need you to show your work. Originally, it was made as a strong pale ale. Uh, in London, they were making a strong pale ale, and then kind of out of nowhere, and we... You can't find any actual hard facts for this. We can't find hard facts for the other story either. They started marketing it as an India-style pale ale. There became this story, and no one knows whether they made it or they just didn't turn it down, that a ship was heading out to India and had all of this India pale ale on board and was sailing out of London Harbor, got in a shipwreck, and... Some of the casks of ale floated back to the UK, which they were found. They were broken open. And everyone's like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Uh, why aren't we drinking this? And the IPA was born. So it was just a good marketing story? They were just using the average Joe in Imperial England's fantasies about what exotic India was like and using that exoticism to market their beer? It's just a story that caught the imaginations of Victorian England. It was. It was a great story. Exactly. Marketing has a way of sticking. Okay, let's switch gears. You've talked about how taxation played such a huge role in how beer developed historically. But let's talk about currently. What is your most, I know you have a lot of these, what's your most ridiculous story of how regulation and taxation has affected the modern beer industry? Hmm, most ridiculous beer story. It's okay. You can take a second to ponder it. Yes, much pondering. So if you know how uh, Prohibition worked, when Prohibition was repealed, the control of alcohol regulations was given over to the states and local municipalities to control how they wanted to handle alcohol sales. What that has created is the U.S., each state has its own alcohol control board and it gets to write its own laws about how alcohol is controlled in each state. You mean like how in Washington we can buy liquor and beer in the grocery store, but in other places, if you want wine, beer, liquor, anything, you have to go to a state-controlled liquor store or things like that? Exactly. Well, what's really interesting is how that's affected specifically the craft beer community in each state. One of my favorite weird facts is up until about a year and a half ago when the state was sued, the state of Texas declared – that all beer that was over 6% alcohol by volume was required to be called ale. Really? Not beer? Yep. If it was beer, it's over 6%. It was required to be called either ale or malt liquor. Wait, so that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I am not an expert on beer, but my favorite beer is a Scottish Ruby Ale, and that's like 4 or 5% ABV, I think. So... Ale has its own generally accepted definition, right? And it's not more than 6% alcohol. So in traditional definitions, an ale is a beer that is fermented with Saccharomyces cerevisiae at a relatively warm temperature that generally has yeast flavors that are fruitier. That's an ale. So Texas is not only creating this whole new category for labeling, but they're also co-opting a word that already has a very clear definition for the entire rest of the world and trying to say it means something completely different in Texas. Exactly. Why? I mean, why would they come up with this new random law that's so confusing? What on earth was the motivation for that? For taxation? Oh man, because they're Texas. If you went into like a grocery store and bought a, a like a I bought a 12-pack from Sam Adams, their winter 12-pack. It's one of my favorite 12-packs because it usually has like eight different beers in it. 
and it's got a bunch of really interesting stuff in it. Well, they made a chocolate bock. A bock is a type of lager. It is a strong lager. It is their chocolate bock was eight percent. Most bocks are somewhere between six and a half, and I mean, if you go with the Doppelbock, it could be as high as like eleven, twelve percent. So, because it's more than that six percent limit, it's eight percent alcohol. It would have to be labeled as ale. But it's a lager, and on it, it would say chocolate bock, and in parentheses, ale in Texas. Okay, let me see if I can put this in context quick for any of our listeners who aren't beer aficionados. That would be kind of like walking into the grocery store and going to get a a roll of Pillsbury buttermilk biscuits or something. And when you pick up the roll, it says buttermilk biscuits, but cupcakes in New York, right? Exactly, because it had to be because it's an ale, because it had to be considered an ale in Texas, even if it wasn't. It was actually a lager. And so they were actually sued by a brewery in Austin, I believe. I think it was Jester King was the one who sued them and said, basically, uh, I don't care what you're, uh, what, who you are. You can't redefine words because you're the state of Texas. And that got upheld, and the state of Texas Alcohol Beverage Commission had to change their laws. Let's transition really quick, though. We just talked about labeling laws. Let's talk about homebrewing laws, because I know you've talked about before how uh, I mean, obviously, prohibition had a horrific effect on beer, homebrewing, microbrewing, all of it. But let's talk about how that came back, how those laws changed, and how that shaped the homebrewing industry. So in 1978, Jimmy Carter signed the legislation that allowed people to brew in their homes again. You're allowed to brew 100 gallons of beer per adult over 21 in the household up to 200 gallons of beer per year, as long as you're not selling it without having to be licensed by the Tax and Trade Bureau, which at that point in time was the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, or your state licensing. When that happened, about 10 to 20 states automatically legalized home brewing. Washington was one of them uh, because home brewing was already legal in Washington before it was illegal in the nation because we just didn't care. Yeah, that's a pretty accurate summary of the Pacific Northwest. Mm Mm-hmm. May of 2013 was when the state of Alabama finally legalized homebrewing, and homebrewing was legal in all 50 states for the first time since Prohibition. So why did Alabama take so long? Um, They were worried about moonshiners. Yeah, well, I can kind of see the logic in a twisted way, but... But there's, if you're a homebrewer, you're not a moonshiner. Well, yeah, by definition. I mean, moonshining is, by definition, using corn mash or another mash to distill high-proof illegal liquors, not brew beer. So why was Alabama conflating the two? Because they don't understand. And because the Baptist Church still has a really strong lobby in Alabama and Mississippi, for that instance. Uh, both of those, they legalized uh, homebrewing within two or three months of each other. They were the last two holdouts. Utah was like fifth or sixth from the end. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So these states that had the highest percentage of religious teetotalers were the last ones to legalize it. Exactly. So there, there's on YouTube, you search for uh, Alabama homebrewing legislation discussion, and you will find some of the greatest lines about not understanding alcohol in general and uh, homebrewing it specifically. They're fantastic. Yeah, like what? My favorite was there was a uh, um, a senator who said that his bottle of Chivas Regal had a stamp on it from the government that said it was healthy. And how are we going to know whether home brewing was – whether the stuff that people made in their homes was going to be healthy? That's That's beautiful. All right, I'll see if I can find that, and we'll put a link to that on our website for anyone who wants to uh, check it out. So – Just kind of to summarize, what I'm hearing is that a lot of the laws uh, around uh, beer labeling, around homebrewing, around microbrewing have been kind of restrictive for the industry. So not always making it hard. Sometimes it actually makes it easier. It's one of the reasons why Washington has such an insular beer community. Washington has, and Seattle specifically, has an unending desire for beer and good beer. And if you're an out-of-state brewery and you want to, you want to have any beer inside the state at all served in any format, you must be distributed through a distributor in Washington. If you are a brewery that is in the state, you can self-distribute. So we have a, a beer community where we have a lot of breweries in Washington that don't distribute outside of Washington because they don't have to. 
That makes sense because there'd be less competition because there isn't as much beer coming across the border. I mean, a, a small brewery 30 miles east of here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, or uh, just across the border in uh, Portland, Oregon, which has a huge craft brewing culture, they'd have higher costs and more hoops to jump through just to get their beer into Washington stores or restaurants. They'd have to get a distributor to agree to a high volume, whereas here... A local brewery can just distribute directly to the grocery stores or restaurants or anywhere else they want to sell it. Well, that wasn't necessarily planned. It was more kind of a happy medium. Also in Colorado, another state with a very strong beer community, the law, the big law that affects them is you can't buy beer in a grocery store unless it's below 3.2 percent alcohol. Uh, that's ridiculous. That rules out just about everything, doesn't it? It's ridiculous. The only thing you can get is like Bud Light in a grocery store. However, Colorado did does not have central control of the liquor stores in the state. So you have all privately owned liquor stores. Well, those privately owned liquor stores are the only place where you can get beer that's above 3.2%. So they've worked really well with the breweries and gotten in a lot of specific beer. And that's helped create that smaller beer scene. You have to go to the liquor store, but they have to be competing on selection that's the only way they're going to be competing against each other is on selection, so they get a lot more beer. So that's kind of helped out the Colorado breweries. Again, it wasn't really planned that way. So what do you think is next for the craft brewing and home brewing industries? I mean, it seems like there's a new tap house or craft brewery opening up almost on every corner in Spokane some days. Uh, what do you think's next? So I would imagine somewhere between the next three and ten years we're going to have another craft beer bubble pop. What do you mean another bubble pop? It's one that happened in the late 1990s, and we lost a good 10 or 15% of the breweries. What caused that bubble to burst? Oversaturation and not very good beer. Um, and I think that's what's going to do it again. You're going to have oversaturation, especially in some of these places like Seattle. Now, you used to actually work for a beer distributor in the Seattle area, so that you're not just saying this as a... a average consumer or even home brewer, like you really know the area. Can you give us some more insight into what it is about Seattle that makes you think it's so primed for a bubble burst? They have a huge number of breweries. Inside the city limits, there are something like 80 breweries in only the city limits of Seattle, like 1.3 million people and 80 breweries. Whoa, that's a, that's a pretty bad ratio. So, I mean, if there's, hang on, let me do some math. That that works out to like six to 8,000 people for every brewery. Exactly. In King County, I think there's over 100. So the Seattle has a lot of smaller breweries. The standard for, for the beer industry is what's called a brewer's barrel. It's 31 gallons. Normal large kegs you see at a bar or anything are what's called a half barrel keg, which is a 15 and a half gallons. You also have quarter barrel kegs and six barrel kegs. Annual production for most breweries in Washington are probably four to 8,000 barrels per year, which seems large until you realize that AB InBev produced 150 million barrels last year. And the problem is in breweries, you have to be well capitalized and you have to have a good understanding of marketing and make good beer. You're going to end up with breweries that can't do one of those three things and fail. So I expect that's going to happen, which honestly will probably strengthen the market because we need stronger breweries and not more of them. But I think that the craft beer industry is going to continue to grow mar its market share. In Seattle, we're already, I think we're somewhere over 40% market share. Oregon is the first state to be majority craft. Craft has over 50% of the market share in Oregon. For the, it's still going to grow. So I think we're going to have a constriction of the amount of breweries that we have. What about the homebrewing industry? Where is that heading? I think homebrewing is going to continue because homebrewing gives the people who work in a tech job who do something with their hands. There's a large movement to being more self-sustainable and like to getting more everything becoming more local and you can't get more local than making your own beer at home. And so I think it's going to continue to grow. There's over 10 million households that homebrew in the United States. Uh, the president made beer in the white house. As far as we know, it's the first time there has ever been home homebrew made in the white house. He's not the first 
president to brew, Washington and Thomas Jefferson are not brew. And I think there's a couple other presidents who probably brewed who we don't know as well. But yeah, so I think it's still going to grow. That's kind of where the future is looking, at least in my mind. But we can't maintain double digit growth forever. So it's going to it's going to peel off. But I don't know that that's going to happen for a while. I think that'll happen somewhere around between 40 and 70 percent market share for craft as a whole. The other thing that we're that is going to happen in the future and has already started to happen is mergers, both non-craft breweries purchasing craft breweries and craft breweries purchasing other craft breweries. Now, that's already happening in the industry. Talk to us some more about mergers. Recently, um, uh, Elysian was bought out by AB InBev. Elysian, you took us there, right? When we visited you and Emily back in like 2010, I think. It's a little brew pub on Capitol Hill in Seattle, right? Yeah, they're, before they got bought out, they were the biggest craft brewery in Seattle or in, in Washington State. And I think they were in the top 20 for largest craft brewery in the U.S. when they were bought out. I've heard that they're not doing as well. Why is that? I mean, obviously, this is your opinion. uh, But as a beer enthusiast and a Seattle local, what changed? The first is that a lot of the people who drink craft beer drink craft beer because it's not corporate beer. So um, you're going to have to deal with that because now all of a sudden you're quote unquote a corporate sellout, which was specifically an issue with uh, Elysian because Elysian makes a beer called Loser Pale Ale that was made for Sub Pop Records, which is another Seattle local Seattle independent record label. And the tagline for Loser is corporate beer still sucks. <laughs> Oh, man, that's horrible. Did it not occur to them to change it or that that would look really, really weird to consumers now that it's owned by? That is now owned by AB InBev. Um, Also, within days of buying out Elysian was the Super Bowl. In the Super Bowl, uh, Budweiser ran a an ad celebrating being macro. And in that ad, they made a a comment about um, let them have their pumpkin peach beer. They thought that that was a joke and meant to be something completely ridiculous. What they did not know is that four months before that, in October, Elysian did the Great Pumpkin Beer Festival, which they do every single year. And in that, they made a pumpkin pecan peach beer called Gorgia on my mind. (laughs) Oh, come on. No. No. Yeah. Oh, come on. That is so bad. So let me make sure that I'm getting this straight. So they are inadvertently bashing their own subsidiary's core customer group during the largest sporting event of the year a few days after they purchase the small brewery. Well, and Elysian made a large portion of its money at its brew pubs. Elysian was not a singular packaging and distributing brewery. They weren't weren't a fully production brewery. They had a production brewery, a 200-barrel brew house producing, I think they were up, uh, they were at 650,000 barrels in 2014. But they have three uh, brew pubs in Seattle. All of those places, my understanding is, have lost business because, and this is my opinion, I like Elysian's beer. From what I've heard, nothing has really changed formulation-wise. But why would I buy a six-pack of Elysian beer when I can buy a six-pack of beer from two beers or a six-pack of beer from insert local brewery here? Or I know the money is going back into the community as opposed to going into the pockets of a Belgian beer giant headquartered in Brazil. It sounds like a pretty fundamental marketing and core value conflict where the way that this larger macro brewing corporation markets and even thinks about their brand is so uh, different from how the microbrewery's core customers think and feel and, and what their values and their decision making processes. So if macro breweries and these large con- corporate well, conglomerates are buying up these smaller craft breweries, what actually defines a craft brewery? How do we know what that really means? So um, the Brewers Association, which is the association for the trade association for craft brewers, has a line that is continuously moving. It is continuously moving based off of Sam Adams. Will always be moving based off of Sam Adams because Sam Adams gives them a lot of money and it is the oldest craft brewery and is now the largest wholly American-owned brewery in the U.S. For the longest time, 
the standard was 500,000 barrels. Then Sam Adams made 600,000 barrels and they bumped it up to 2 million barrels. So then the line was 2 million barrels for about five or six years. And then Sam Adams made 3 million barrels and they bumped it up to 6 million barrels. That is currently where the standard uh, sits. The standard for a craft brewer, according to the Brewers Association, it must be a small brewery, which is less than 6 million barrels brewed a year. I don't know if that's my definition of small, but that's theirs. It must be independent, which means it cannot be owned more than 25% by any entity that it is not itself a craft brewer. That actually um, removes all of the places such as Legion and Ten Barrel and Blue Star Brewing in New York, which was bought by AB, and a couple other breweries. One of them being the Craft Brewing Craft Brewers Alliance. The irony is not lost there. They're called the Craft Brewers Alliance, but they're not a craft brewer because they're owned 30% by Anheuser-Busch. When they initially, when Red Hook initially looked to expand to national um, distribution, that was in the early 90s. And all the national distribution was owned by either Budweiser or Miller or Coors. That's what owned it all. So in order to get into distribution channels, they gave up 30% of the business to get those distribution channels way back in the 90s. They're kind of in a weird world between a craft brewer and a mass-produced brewer because even though the Craft Brewer Alliance is still smaller than Sam Adams, they're in the same boat as Sam Adams where people don't really believe that they're a craft brewery. Even though Sam Adams meets the Brewers Association definition of a craft brewery and Craft Brewer Alliance doesn't, neither of them are considered by a craft brewery by most beer people. And then the four, third uh, definition is they must use ingredients that are used to help the beer's flavor, which that's the one that's gotten the most uh, frustration because Yingling, um, the U.S.'s oldest brewery, is not considered a craft brewery because they use corn in their mash, but corn is traditionally used to uh, lighten the body of a beer. Oh, but that's that's body, not flavor, so it wouldn't count. So... No pun intended, <laughs> but it sounds like that definition of what constitutes craft beer is being kind of diluted. Exactly. So earlier, before we started recording, you told me that the actual science of brewing is advancing so quickly that by the time you learn something, it's basically out of date. What do you mean by that? Can you give me an example? I have a book that's a year and a half here. Let me explain a year and a half, maybe two years old, For the Love of Hops. I think it was released in 2012. So it's three years old. And I went and saw the guy who wrote this book named Stan Hieronymus, who's an incredible dude. I went and wa uh, watched one of his talks in 2013, and he told me half of this book is out of date. Because there's that much research into what's going on with hops and new hop forms. It is continuously being updated. What are they learning about hops? I mean, beyond the obvious bitterness and preservation. Yeah, most of the bitterness is pretty well understood. It's been the flavor and aroma that's not well understood because we didn't have a reason to research it for hundreds of years. What we've been able to do is ref use science to refine and to uh, separate out what we want, which has helped the beer community make higher quality beer and has set a better foundation for experimentation. Now, before we go, can you point our listeners who want to learn more about the history and science of brewing towards some books or resources that you'd recommend? So if you want to learn to brew, I recommend um, the book How to Brew by John Palmer. That's a very uh, succinct introduction to brewing that's heavy, more heavy on the science. The other brewing book is the one that I re received when I was started my journey, which was uh, the Complete Joy of Home Brewing by Charlie Papazian, uh, who is known as kind of the godfather of home brewing. He started out teaching at a local college when it was illegal, and he formed what was called the American Homebrewers Association, which lobbied to get the law changed to make home brewing legal in the United States. So he's kind of the godfather. He gets more into the history, and it's a much more entertaining read and much less mm -hmm. scientific. He has coined the term that most homebrewers use, which is relax, don't worry, have a homebrew. Because so many people stress out about making uh, their beer perfect, and you shouldn't stress. And he has determined that if you worry, then the yeast can understand your worry and will make worse beer for it. That's why he says to relax, no, don't worry, and have a homebrew. My kind of spinoff on that that I like to tell new brewers is barley wants to become beer so you have to do a lot wrong 
to ruin it. It's a process that wants to happen. So as long as you kind of generally allow it to happen and don't mess around too much, it will do what it's going to do. That's brilliant. I love that. I mean, if there's anything I've realized as we've been studying the series is that grain has been turning into beer all on its own for millennia without us doing a, a darn thing in most cases. Exactly. Since long before we even realized what went into beer. Hey, Mark, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and uh, talk to us and share all this awesome information. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, everyone, if you enjoyed this episode of The Hidden History of Business, please let us know. You can tweet us at at Hidden Biz, B-I-Z, or go ahead and tweet Mark directly. His Twitter handle is at Fermenter Blog. He's a pretty awesome guy. Encourage you to get to know him better. Also, we love feedback, so if you'd like to head over to iTunes or Facebook and leave us a review, we would really appreciate it. We love to know what you think. If you'd like to learn more about the subject that we discussed today, you can find multimedia content, links to articles we discussed, and videos on our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business and on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening.